This is lecture 17 on the sampling distribution of the mean. This lecture is very close analog of lecture 16, where we considered the sampling distribution of the uh, proportion. Um, so we will see almost everything here corresponds pretty closely to something in the last lecture. The important thing is, remember, in the last lecture, we were looking at a population, we were looking at a categorical binary variable, so a yes or no variable. The parameter was the proportion p, and then we considered, as you run through all possible samples, the sample proportion p hat in each case represents a random variable. Each time you select a sample and compute p hat, that's a probability experiment, and we describe the distribution of that random variable. We're going to do the same thing here, but with a numerical variable, and therefore we'll be looking at the population mean as the parameter and the sample mean as the statistic, which will be our sampling random variable. So let's start with an example. Young men's heights are roughly bell-shaped. They have a mean of 70 inches, which was, is 5 foot 10, and a standard deviation of 2 and a half inches. So that means that if you randomly select a man, his height on average will be 5 foot 10, but any value from 5 foot 5 to 6 foot 3 would not be unusual because that's two standard deviations from the mean. So that gives you a sense of what kind of values you'd expect if you picked someone at random and measured their height. Now I want you to suppose instead of picking one man, we take a sample of 12 men. We measure all their heights and we average them to get the statistic x bar. That's the sample mean. What kind of a number would you expect to get? Well, I'm guessing your intuition would tell you on average x bar should be 70 inches, the population mean, but of course each sample may be a little higher or a little lower, and that's the question we want to ask. How much higher or lower? What would be a typical or usual range of values for the sample mean? And what would be the shape of the histogram of all those values of x bar? Notice I'm capitalizing it there because I want to start thinking of it as a random variable. Okay, so let's talk about that in generality. So suppose x is any numerical variable in some population, and let's call its mean mu sub x and its standard deviation sigma sub x. Now we want to consider the random variable, which consists of taking a sample of size n and measuring x bar. It's a repeatable process, different outcome each time, and the outcomes, x bar, are numbers. So it's a random variable. It's called the sampling distribution of the mean, and it has, under favorable circumstances, three properties. The three properties are its mean, mu sub x bar, is the same as the mean of the original variable, mu sub x. That's what we said before, that we would expect x bar, on average, to be 70 in the case of men's heights. Less guessable, its standard error, remember, standard deviation of the sampling distribution is called standard error. Its standard error, sigma sub x bar, is the original standard deviation, sigma sub x, divided by the square root of n. This is kind of similar to, remember, in the standard deviation formula for a proportion, we also had a divided by n inside a square root, and we had the same effect here, which is the bigger n is, the less variation there is in x bar. The averaging process sort of averages the variation out, if you like. Um, and also, more straightforwardly, the bigger the standard deviation of the original variable, the bigger the standard deviation of x bar, of course. The more variation in men's heights you have, the more variation you'd expect in the average of men's heights. And the last fact is that if n is big enough, the shape of the histogram is roughly normal. Once again, normal, we know its mean, we know its standard deviation, we know everything. So once again, I have to tell you the fine print. Um, again, there are three assumptions, and again, the first one is the simple random sample assumption. Of course, we need this to be a simple random sample, even for the mean statement to be true. Um, and again, that formula for the standard error is assu assumes that you're sampling with replacement. If, as in the usual case, you're not, 
then uh, that is only an approximation, which is good enough if the large population assumption is met. So that is, if the population is at least 20 times the sample size. So the first two assumptions are exactly the same as before. The normality assumption is going to be a different assumption. Remember, before it was the rule of 15. Uh, here it's going to be different, and it comes from one of the deepest facts in probability and statistics, which is the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem says that if x is any distribution, and we imagine computing the distribution of xn, x bar for different n, as n gets larger, it approaches a normal distribution. What does that mean? Well, when n is small, x bar, the distribution of x bar is going to look a lot like the distribution of n, sort of smoothed out a little. But as n gets larger, first that distribution becomes more and more unimodal, and then it becomes more and more symmetric, and finally it starts to look very much like a normal distribution. Here's an example. I don't actually have the distribution of x, but I have, um, this is x bar when n is 4, which looks a lot like the distribution of x. And you can see it's highly skewed, and it's extremely, at least bimodal, maybe multimodal, uh, and the mean is marked off there. And now, as n gets bigger, here you see n equals 8, n equals 16, 32, 64, and 128. What you, the general effect that you see happening is it smooths out, the peaks get smaller, and the valleys get bigger. And so gradually that modality, multimodality disappears. Right? By the time n equals 16, they're just little wobbles. And then by the time n is 32, it's clearly unimodal. The skewness more slowly disappears. n equals 16, it is cl clearly distinctly skewed. n equals 32, it's still very slightly skewed. By the time you get to n equals 64, you really barely can tell any skew at all, and it's really indistinguishable from a normal distribution, even more so at n equals 128. You can also tell if you look at the scales here, you can see that the variation, the standard deviation, is getting smaller, as you would expect. That's the central limit theorem. We will not spend a lot of time on that, but what it tells you is that you can assume x bar is roughly normal if n is big enough or if x is close enough to normal. There's some trade-off between the size of n and the niceness of x. The rule of thumb we will use, which tries to capture that trade-off, and is the most general and versatile rule. Some places you will hear other simpler versions of this rule, which are not nearly as versatile. The rule is called the 0 15 40 rule. Um, there are three ways that you can conclude that x bar is normal. Any one of these is good enough. Um, so the first one is, if x is known to be normal. So in practice, for us, that means if the question tells you that x is normal. There's no other way to know that x is going to be normal, uh, unless you're deeply familiar with that variable from having seen lots and lots of data. Uh, so that's, if the question tells you that x is normal, you're done. You don't have to worry about n at all. The second way of meeting the normality condition, the 0, 15, 40 rule, so that was the 0 part. The second way, the 15 part, is the hybrid. If n is middling, if n is at least 15 and x is not too skew and has no major outliers, then you're fine. We saw in that picture, by the time n got to 15, the only problem that really was remaining was skewness. And finally, if n is more than 40, then regardless of what x looks like, you can assume that x bar is normal. This is a rule of thumb. It doesn't work perfectly, but it's good enough. I will show you, after you've practiced a bit, a nice mnemonic to help you remember. Uh, so let's practice. Let's see what this looks like in practice. Typical kind of problem is this. We said young American men's heights are bell-shaped with a mean of 70 inches and a standard deviation of 2.5 inches. You take a simple random sample of 12 young American men, and you compute their average height x bar. We want to find the mean and standard error of x bar. We want to find the probability of getting an x bar more than 6 feet. 
of a probability of getting an x bar less than 5 foot 6, and we're going to ask between what two values can we be 95% sure your answer will fall. So I'm going to take you through all the steps of that, including checking the assumptions. The first one or two times through, I'm going to check each assumption and then do the calculations that that justifies to remind you what each assumption is telling you. Um, but once we've done that once or twice, in actual problems, we will typically check all the assumptions at once, usually first thing or sometimes after having done the calculation. As always, when the assumptions aren't met, we will go ahead and do the calculations, even though in real life that would be a cause for concern and possibly for not doing the calculations at all. So the three assumptions. The first one, simple random sample. You check by looking at the wording of the question. We see it says you're taking a simple random sample, so that assumption is met. Remember, that justifies uh, the fact that mu sub x bar equals mu sub x. So we know that our distribution, our sampling distribution, has a mean of 70 inches. The second assumption, just like before, is the large population assumption. We need the population to be more than 20 times the sample size. Since the sample size is 12, we need the population to be more than 240. What's the population? It's young American men. So we need there to be more than 240 young American men. Of course, there are millions of young American men. Whatever young means here, there are millions. So that the independence assumption, or the large population assumption, is met. So we're justified in computing the standard error. Sigma of x bar is sigma x over the square root of n. In our case, that's 2.5 as the standard deviation of x. n is 12, so we divide by the square root of 12, and we get 0.722 inches. Notice our standard error is much smaller than the original standard deviation. That means there's much less variation in x bar than there is in x. OK, so we've got our mean and standard deviation. To use norm dist, we have to check the 0, 15, 40 rule, that it guarantees that x bar is close enough to normal. Um, now I'm going to check each of the conditions, but you don't have to. As long as one condition is met, you don't have to think about the others. But just to give you practice, I'm going to go through. The fact that n is 12 means there's no way we can satisfy condition 2 or condition 3, the 15 or 40 conditions. n isn't big enough. So our only hope in this case, is knowing that x is normal. The problem told you that x is bell-shaped, so we meet condition 1, so we meet this assumption. So we've met all three assumptions in this case, therefore we can assume x bar is normal. And now we can start doing calculations. First question, what is the chance that the average you get will be more than 6? Uh, that's the probability that x bar is greater than 72, more than 6 feet. 6 feet is 72 inches. Greater than 72 is 1 minus norm disk 72. And um, we'll use a uh, mean of 70. And notice I put in the exact formula for the standard error. Once again, this is one to put the exact formula in rather than approximation, because sometimes it will really affect the answer and we find out the probability of it being over 6 feet is 0.279%, quite small. And that makes sense, because 6 feet is 2 inches above the mean, and the standard error is 0.722, so 6 feet is almost 3 standard deviations above the mean. So that's very unlikely. Just once, I'm going to show you this norm dist calculation. From here on in, you should be watching this with Excel open, and when I do a calculation, you should stop and go and do it in Excel and make sure that you've got it. Everything we do from here on in will be Excel calculations, and they're not deep. You practice them a few times, you'll be fine at them. But if you don't practice them, then you'll, you'll, they are hard, they're easy to mess up, and they'll take up a ton of time. All right, so let's go and see if we can do this in Excel. I am going to close this file and sorry and I'm going to open up a new file very slowly my Excel is a little pokey and now 
I've already forgotten, but my mean is 70, my standard deviation is 2.5, and my n is 12. I don't have to keep checking, I'm going to put these all there. So that means my standard error is the standard deviation divided by the square root of n, which is 12. 0.722 as advertised. So probability of having greater than 72 inches equals 1 minus norm dist 72. The mean is 70. The standard error is 0.722. And again, we put 1 at the end. I recommend doing the calculations in this form where you calculate each piece referring to the previous cells, because the next problem, you may just have to change those numbers and all the rest of the calculations come out right. And sure enough, we get 0 0.00279, which corresponds to 0.279%. And let's return to full screen mode. Second question is, what is the chance that X bar will be less than 5 foot 6 inches? And unfortunately, this got cut off, but I'm going to say it out loud. The probability that X bar is less than 66, upper bound, no lower, means we just do norm dist. The first entry is 66, the second is 70, and the third is the standard error, 2.5 over the square root of 12. The fourth is 1 and we get a very small number, 1.49 times 10 to the negative eighth. That is 0.00000149%. It's exceedingly unlikely. It's pretty much guaranteed not to happen. And again, 66 inches is four inches below the mean, which is something like six standard deviations below the mean. That practically never happens. The next question is a little bit of a new wrinkle. It asks, between what two values will 95% of the sample's sample mean fall? We could use the empirical rule and say, oh, it's within two standard deviations. But now that we know for a normal distribution, the more precise answer is 1.96. We can answer that simply as within 1.96 standard errors of the mean. This is a calculation work, and I do a lot, and that's why I'm trying to get you into the habit. So we take 70 plus or minus 1.96 times the standard error of 0.722, and when you work that out, we find out that 95% of samples will give you a sample mean between 68.6 and 71.4. So you go out and measure 10, 12 men's heights and compute X bar, probably, you're going to get within that range, 68.6 to 71.4 inches. Remember, X bar is a sampling distribution. That means it's a random variable where the procedure is taking a sample and computing a statistic, which means that when you talk about probabilities in the context of X bar, when you say 95%, you're saying 95% of samples. Anything probabilistic statements you make about X bar or P hat that say something like 95%, almost certainly it means something is true of 95% of samples. That is something we will work on. Okay, let's do another example. This time I haven't done the calculations, so why don't you try the calculations and then do it along with me and see how well you do. The mean cost of a haircut for an American college student is $18, with a standard deviation of $22. What's the probability that a simple random sample of 52 college students will have an average haircut of less than $16? How about between $17 and $19? And again, I ask, between what two values would 95% of all such samples fall? And finally, another new wrinkle on the kinds of questions we've been asking, if I actually got an average of $30 in my sample, would that suggest that there was something wrong with my sampling or with the presumed mean and standard deviation given above?
Okay, once again, let's go through the assumptions and note what each of them implies. It says that it's a simple random sample, right, in the wording. So therefore, the first assumption is met, A, and therefore the mean of X bar, X bar is the average cost of everybody in the sample, is going to be $18. The second assumption, the large population assumption, says the population needs to be more than 20 times the sample size of 52, it means it needs to be more than 1,040. Our population is American college students, so we have to conclude, we have to ask if there are more than 1,040 college students in America, and certainly there are. So we're entitled to compute, conclude the standard error, sigma x bar, is the standard deviation of 22 over the square root of the sample size, 52, which is 3.05. So the standard error is $3 and change. And that gives you a sense of how much two different x bars, how much they're going to vary from two different samples. OK, that's what we computed. The third assumption, can we use norm dist? That's the 0, 15, 40 rule. And again, as soon as you see that it meets one of the assumptions, you're done. And in this case, it's quite simple to see that it meets assumption three, but I'm going to go through and check all three just to give you practice. Um, we don't know that x is normal, so we can't use assumption one. It doesn't say. We don't know. We're also not told anything about the, um, the skewness of x, so we can't do assumption two. In fact, uh, we know that sigma, remember the original sigma of 22, is bigger than the mean of 18. And remember, when a variable that can only be positive has a standard deviation nearly as big as its mean, or even more so, bigger, that suggests that it's a highly skewed distribution. So we're pretty sure that x is very skewed. Um, so we don't meet condition 2. But condition 3, that the sample size is more than 40, we meet because the sample size is 52. So we can assume that x bar is normal. Now we can do calculations. First one asked, what's the chance that x bar is less than 16? Probability that x bar is less than 16, less than a number, we have an upper bound, means we just do norm dist. You put in 16, you put in the mean of 18, you put in the standard error of 3.05, but it's best to put the exact formula in, comma 1, and we get 25.6%. Shouldn't be surprising, because 16 is 18 minus 2, so it isn't even one standard deviation below the mean, so to get less than it, we'd expect more than the probability to be well above a sixth. How about between 17 and 19? Norm dist of the bigger minus norm dist of the smaller. Putting all those quantities in, I'm doing them on Excel on the side, and you should too, and I get 25.7%. Once again, uh, that is about a third of a standard deviation down and a third of a standard deviation up, and if you look at that, you won't have much of a sense, but you would expect that it's more than 10 or 15% and less than 50%. So that looks reasonable. Next question asked, between what two values would 95% of samples give an average hair cost between? And that is 18 the mean plus or minus 1.96 times the standard error of 3.05, which means you'd expect it to come between 12 and $24. Any time, and I ask my different classes, if you could treat those as simple random samples, I should expect that 95% of the time I'll get an answer between $12 and $24 for the average. Finally, I asked, would getting over 30 be a really surprising event, getting 30 or higher? So the way I measure the surprisingness of 30 is, I ask, what's the probability of getting at least 30? Probability of getting exactly 30 is zero. That doesn't tell you anything probability of getting at least 30 does tell you how unusual 30 is. So the probability x bar is greater than 30, means a 1 minus norm dist, 1 minus norm dist 30 
and I get a very small number. 4 times 10 to the negative fifth means it happens 4 times out of every 100,000 tries. So it's incredibly unlikely to happen. Which means that if you did get 30, probably something is, is not right. Either your sampling isn't right, perhaps you're somehow sampling people with overly expensive haircut habits, or those original assumptions about the mean and standard deviation of haircut costs were not correct. <clears throat> this is a model for reasoning we're going to do in the future. If you have a set of assumptions and it predicts reason, a range of reasonable for some quantity, and you get something far outside that range, it means either some of your assumptions are wrong, so it is evidence against those assumptions, or you did something wrong, which essentially means that some of your assumptions are wrong. All right, here's another example. You try this by yourself. College students' heights are bimodal and symmetric. Bimodal, because they're a mix of men and women. Bimodal and symmetric, with a mean of 68 inches and a standard deviation of 3.5 inches. If you take a simple random sample of 18 college students and compute their average height x-bar, what would be the mean and standard error of x-bar, check all the assumptions, and find the probability you would get an average height for your sample that was over 70 inches. Okay, check the assumptions. Simple random sample, it says it, check. Large population, we would need more than 20 times the sample size of 18, so more than 360 college students, of course, lots of college students, so that's easily met. Third, because it's a numerical variable, the third assumption is the 0, 15, 40 rule. 18 is greater than 15, so we're okay if x is not too skewed. We're told that x is bimodal and symmetric, so x is not too skewed, and therefore the second condition of the 0, 15, 40 rule is met, so x bar is normal. That allows us to do our calculations, mu of x bar, equals mu of x equals 68, sigma x bar equals standard deviation of x, which is 3.5, over the square root of the sample size, which is 18, which works out 2.825, and the chance that x bar is more than 70 is probability x bar greater than 70. You have a lower bound, but not an upper bound, so you do 1 minus norm dist of 70, you put in the mean of 68, the standard error of 3.5 with the square root 18. You put in a 1, and we get another small number, 0.767%. These probabilities are often small in these problems. Okay, here's what you should be able to do now. After watching this lecture, you should be able to say what we mean by the sampling distribution of x bar and what it represents. Once again, each time you take a sample of size n, and compute x bar, you get another entry in this distribution. The sampling distribution of x bar is the distribution or the histogram of all of those values. You should be able to calculate the mean and standard deviation of x bar using the mean and standard deviation of x along with the sample size. You should be able to check the independence assumption, which for us is the large population assumption, and what it tells you. If the population is more than 20 times the sample size, then the standard deviation formula is correct. You should be able to check the normality assumption, which is the 0, 15, 40 rule, and know what it tells you. If the 0, 15, 40 rule is correct, is met, then you are allowed to use norm dist. Remember, the 0, 15, 40 rule is met if either you know your, pop, know your variable, original variable is normal, or if n is at least 15 and the distribution of your original variable is not too skewed and doesn't have major outliers, or if n <coughs> is at least 40, and finally you should be able to calculate the probabilities of x bar using norm dist. This is the end of my lecture, but I want to show you one more slide to raise your awareness of a distinction that, has, that proves subtle for people. Going forward, this distinction is going to happen over and over again. We're going to have a lecture where I tell you what happens for the categorical variable, 
and then a lecture where I tell you what happens for the numerical variable. They are deeply, closely analogous. There is, for each assumption on one side, there's an assumption on the other. For each formula on one side, there's a similar formula on the other. There, a lot of it's the same, and lots of it is different. It's just similar enough that it's really easy to get confused, and just different enough that if you get confused, everything goes wrong. So going forward, you want to get into the habit, when you look at a problem, you want to decide categorical or numerical. We did that at the beginning of the semester. It's only harder now because there's a lot more going on. But here's the process. First, ask yourself, what's the sample? It's usually easy to tell what your sample is made up of. Once you know that, you know what individuals are. Knowing what individuals are means you know roughly what the population is. But more importantly, once you think about each individual, ask yourself, what if I did this study, what data would I have to gather about each individual? What piece of information would I write down next to each individual's name? And if it's a yes or no question, categorical. If it's a number, numerical. Okay, so here is 16 and 17 summarized in one slide. If the original variable, the population distribution, is categorical, that is, if the variable is a yes or no question, then we're looking at the parameter p, the proportion. Our statistic is p hat, the uh, sample proportion. The mean of p hat is p. The standard error of p hat is the square root of p times 1 minus p over n. And our assumptions are the simple random sample, the large population, and the rule of 15. Remember, that says that we need both that n times p and n times 1 minus p are at least 15. If the original variable, the population distribution, is numerical, in both cases the sampling distribution is numerical. That's one of the things that makes this confusing. In that case, the variable is a numerical question, x with a mean mu and a standard deviation sigma. Then our parameter is the mean mu. Our statistic is x bar. For each sample, we get a number x bar, the sample mean. The mean of x bar is the mean of x. Standard error of x bar is standard deviation of x over the square root of n. And our assumptions beyond the simple random sample are the large population assumption, which is the same, and the 0, 15, 40 rule. So rule of 15 for categorical, 0, 15, 40 rule for numerical. And once again, here's the 0, 15, 40 rule. Either x is known to be normal, or n is at least 15 and x is not too skew, or n is at least 40. That concludes the lecture.